All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, Ben, how are you? Doing well. How are you? Good. We are live on serverless office hours. My guest is Ben Kehoe. Uh, ben, I, tell us a little bit about yourself. And I brought up I brought up this. Now I want you to make sure. Is that title right? Cloud Robotics Research Scientist? Yes. And AWS Serverless Hero. My, and, I've got oh, sort of all the buzzwords. That's right. AWS Service Hero. You, in fact, we were talking, I believe, and you can correct me, but I believe you were the first AWS Serverless Hero or one of the first. I was, I was in the first group that got, that got changed from community heroes to serverless heroes when we started splitting everybody out and putting us in silos. That's right. And, and I think you should show them your bling. Oh, right. So, yeah. uh, for reInvent, the, the group of heroes asked for, you know, something that would make us a little visible so that people could identify heroes, feel comfortable coming up to us and asking us questions. And uh, they gave us this. And it nice. really, um, it wasn't exactly what we were thinking about. Uh, <laughs> it, it's quite heavy. It's actually made out of metal. Um, and we said, you know, that's a little ostentatious. So the the the... Next year, they gave us the same thing, except now it spins. That, and that makes it better. Is it still heavy? It's, uh, it's even heavier. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't listen to you, but we gave yeah. you something better. So I it's got true. you. It's I got true. you. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Well, but then also, I believe we gave you a belt. Uh, it, Rebecca yeah. gave me a belt. That's right. I um, say we, but Rebecca. Rebecca. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, uh, it, and I want to I want to explain that, and I'm going to take us uh, real quick here, and we're going to come to that in a second. Just if if you're joining us for the first time, uh, this is Serverless Office Hours. We're every week, 10 a.m. Pacific time, same same bat channel, same bat place. I'm not sure I got that right, but uh, it, it is. Uh, we, you know, we're on YouTube and and Twitter or Twitch live, uh, and and we have you know great hosts. Last week we talked about uh, large payloads in Amazon Vimperage. Had a great conversation with Nick. Uh, and James Bezik on on how to man. If you got a large payload, it's not going to fit in there. How to drop it off in an S3 bucket and do a pointer to it. Uh, we did some cool things with that. Uh, and then this week we're going to be talking about and this is what I wanted to come to: serverless security and suspenders. And and I probably have overdone it, but I've always I've always given Ben a hard time. But he's a suspender where he loves suspenders. Oh, yeah. And and Delta apparently there's a whole philosophy. Give us your philosophy on suspenders. Oh, I just don't like wearing pants that are tight at the waist okay and and the purpose of belts is to make your pants tight at the waist so if you wear suspenders i mean you see clowns right wearing those giant hoop <laughs> things they never yeah. have they never you know their pants oh exactly that's what i'm saying yeah. right now i can't get away with that yeah but i can get away with uh wearing suspenders and looser pants so bad. here's the honest truth. If I loaned you a pair of my shorts, it would look like those clown pants on you. Uh, and and so for folks like me who aren't quite as straight up and down as you are, you're you're a thin guy, tall thin guy. I'm the short. But we're like the number ten standing next to each other. But uh, it, it's it's uh, I wear a belt and you're right after cinch it up. But there was a time I was telling you pretty sure there was a time and you wouldn't know this by seeing how I dress or do anything, but I worked in kind of a highfalutin men's fashion shop right when I got out of high school. And uh, I wore suspenders every day, and yeah. I loved them. I, I absolutely better. loved them. I think I'm going back. I think I'm going yeah. back. Yeah. I mean, so. elastic waistbands also help. You know, it's the same <laughs> kind of deal, but you can only get away with those in, in, in not every situation. Let's put it that way. That's right. So, Ben, where are you coming from? I live in Santa Fe now. Oh, really? Santa Fe, New yeah. Mexico? Yep. I did not know that. I've spent a lot of time there. Yeah. It's, it's a great place. Yeah. About, about 30 miles, 30 or 40 miles from me is a place called Glorietta. And there's a camp. As a kid, I went to this youth camp there uh, growing up. So I uh, spent a lot of time in Santa Fe and go through there. You know, I go through yeah. there driving to my mom's house. I'm going to come by. I'm going I'm to right. bring you Please some do. Diet, Diet Dr. Pepper. So, all right. Well, I, I've, I've, I've yacked at you and we still haven't got to the point. Today we're talking about, again, we're going to talk about the two important parts, maybe not the suspenders, but the serverless security uh, and suspenders. If you don't know, if you haven't followed Ben, 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 first of all, he's a pretty sharp guy. 
Second of all, he's really, really all about security, and he's done a lot of work. And, and a lot of our teams actually will talk to Ben sometimes and go, what do you think? We were talking about this earlier. And, you know, t- tell us what you think. How's this working? Give us give us your feedback on on, on this. And, and Ben has some great, you know, insight to really, you know, locking things down and, and being f- – you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so you can certainly correct me. But he he adds some flexibility with security. He but he your big thing is being secure as absolutely secure as possible. Correct? Is that a fair? Yeah, well, statement? I think yeah, and I think one of the one of the things there is that you know least privilege access, which we tend to talk about sure. as as the ideal, in my opinion, is business logic. Right, that yep. to make something least privilege requires an understanding of the actual task that you're trying to accomplish. And that's unique to the situation that you're in. So it's not something that you can fully sort of hide or delegate away to a provider because they can't know everything about what you're trying to do. So it's important to to have that knowledge to be able to accomplish it. Yeah. I, I, I think that's that's brilliant because I, I agree with you. A lot of times we have folks that just, I mean, they're guilty of the star. Well, I won't do star. I'll do the service star. So it's just that service that I'm given everything access to, right? Rather than, and I think that the point that I, re- I kind of zeroed in on is that understanding your application and understanding what does it need to do and then scoping right down to that very minimal uh, access. That's, I mean, that's least privilege, right? Um, and this is something that our team's been working on, even in our demos, because it used to be, and I know we're guilty of this. Oh, I didn't add, you know, we do, we just did a star for now in the demo because, and then people use that in production and oh my gosh, oh, yeah. you know, so even in, even in our demos, we try to say, look, least privileges and here's how we accomplish that. Cause we want to demo that uh, as well. Um, I've seen, so, I've seen people talk about it as as stars are like little spiders crawling on your policy. You don't want spiders in your security system. That's exactly right. Yeah, it, there, there are just very few things where you kind of still have to star. Like if I'm doing, uh, you know, comprehend or something where where I'm just the service itself. And so, but even well, then, I, yep. you, you you're going to say it. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the thing the, the the biggest thing to understand when you're giving a service star is that that includes both control plane and data plane operations. So if I give DynamoDB star, I'm not only giving permission to read from a table, but I'm also giving permission to delete that table. That's right. That's exactly right. Sometimes I'm intending one, you know, you want to give your ops folks perhaps the control plane operations to be able to create tables, delete them, but not actually look at the data inside there. And alternately, you want to give your application itself the ability to read from that table, but not yeah. actually, you know, delete it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, the, it, it, that's also a, a, an important thing to understand that AWS managed policies also don't make that distinction. So often, you know, there's like a DynamoDB read access policy and it gives read access, but it gives read access on both control and data plane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where I encourage, and we've we, especially with like the, and I know you're familiar, you use SAM, and you're familiar with the SAM uh, policies. When we first started doing these, those they were fairly you, you had crud everything, and and that was that was operations and not not control plane, but it was everything. And so what we started saying is rather than using crud, we say read and delete but not update or, you know, so, so get even more specific uh, real quick. We had some, we have some comments coming in. They're not really questions, but comments. Uh, Mark is out there. Uh, he says, some of us are still unsiloed Ben. So I'm, I'm sure you, you may know what that means. And then he's commenting. Mark, I'm pretty sure. Yep. Yeah. Mark is a community hero. Yes. he um, is, And rightly yep. so. And yeah. so, and, and community heroes are um, not siloed into a particular AWS uh, box. And uh, are often, you know, as a um, as a serverless hero, right? I help, you know, I write things about stuff. But if you look at a lot of the community heroes, they're the people running user groups. They're the people who are, you know, much more engaged in um, in the community and actually, uh, you know, doing doing the much harder harder job of yeah. of educating people, of getting people interested, keeping people up to date. 
Yeah, I, I, and I've been following Mark forever, uh, and I agree with you. We have another uh, a, a celebrity here. Natter has joined us. Hey, Natter, good to see you. Glad you're here. Um, we're going to be talking. Natter used to be a DA here at, uh, at AWS and then is doing some some cool stuff uh, with Web3. <laughs> I, I'm one of those that didn't even know what that is, but I just said it to feel cool right there. So, uh, but he is, he, I one time sat in a room behind Natter, and I, I'm sure I'm saying your name wrong. I've never said it right. I don't even say Ben's name right. Um, but uh, I once sat behind him and watched him as we're in a meeting, as he paid attention, he coded a full application and and released it on Twitter. And I saw the announcement come out on Twitter. I was like, oh my God, I just saw him write that. So uh, great developer, some great things happening. So Ben, I don't want to waste, uh, you know, I know I'm I'm yakking here, but let's jump in. You've got some stuff you're going to sure. demo and it's, it's some pretty, we're, we're diving into some complex stuff. So if you're working with security, I mean, buckle up and, and pay attention and, and I'll ask the questions or, or shoot me, shoot me questions uh, coming in t, uh, to the Twitch here and, and or, or YouTube, uh, whichever you're on. And we'll try to get them so and have Ben answer them and we'll see if we can stump the chump. So there it is. So, all right, I'm going to bring, bring up your screen. You ready? Yeah. All right. All you. So we're going to talk here about uh, a library that I've written, AWS Assume Role Lib, but uh, in general about IAM role assumption, and in particular as it applies to Lambda. And we will uh, throw in a little bit of uh, AWS SSO as well, um, because that's uh, a better way uh, to sign in to AWS uh, than using IAM users or uh, the sort of federated sign-on through assume role with SAML, those kind of things. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, um, you can follow along. Um, this, the code for the demo is up on GitHub. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to create two CloudFormation stacks, one of which has resources in it. It's going to have an S3 bucket and a DynamoDB table, and then an IAM role uh, that has access, potentially has access, um, to those two resources. And we're going to put that in one account, the destination account. Okay. And then in another account, we're going to stand up a CloudFormation stack. And in that, we're going to have a IAM role that has permissions to assume that role across account. And then there are four Lambda functions that use that role. And they're all, they all do the exact same thing, which is go retrieve a value from, uh, or go try to retrieve a value from the resource, and then uh, just return the value. The reason that okay. there are four of them is that we're sort of evolving from the direct approach to role assumption to the sort of more managed approach using this library. Okay. Um, that simplifies yeah. your code, makes it more robust. We do have a request if you could blow your screen up a little more there. I, I know we. Yes. Like, he's got a lot of screens he's been using, so we'll <laughs> yeah we'll blow these up. Um, Let's see here. Cross account. It, cross account's a challenge this one's for bigger. folks. Uh, yes. And I'm, and I'm glad you're tackling this because uh, yeah it 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 can be it, it can that's a challenge is understanding this rights and roles and, and often what we see is again going back to earlier conversation I can't figure this out so I'll just open it wide up. And we'll use security through obscurity and hope nobody gets us right. Yep. Not the approach. So, yeah. And so the, the the most important thing to understand is that AWS accounts are sort of hard security boundaries. So while in an account, you're able to unilaterally grant access to things. So if you say, "Hey, this resource in this account has access to something else in that account," that just works. Um, a resource policy, so like an S3 bucket policy can unilaterally grant access to something within the same account. So if I'm an IAM role inside an account and my, a policy that's attached to me says I have access to, to S3, that gives me access to S3. If the S3 bucket in the same account has a resource policy that says that role gets access, even if the, uh, even if the role doesn't have a policy saying that it has access, it gets access. But then across accounts, both sides have to agree. So if I'm in the source account and my role says, I have access to this thing in this other account, that doesn't give me access. It says that I am potentially have access, but the thing on the other side 
like an S3 bucket, has to also say that I can access it. But again, if on the destination account, the S3 bucket resource policy says the role and the source account has access, but the source account, the role doesn't have uh, a policy saying it has access, that also doesn't work. You have to have both sides agreeing. Right. And those resources, resource policies come in a lot of different types. So S3 buckets have bucket policies. Uh, SQS queues have uh, queue policies. policies. <laughs> Lambdas have permissions. Now, Ben, you just said Lambdas. I was just going to say, and Chris okay, is gone, so I can I, say I, all I, I want. <laughs> he will um, come back and find you, I guarantee you. So, I thought um, that was lowercase Lambda, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, but then other resources, like DynamoDB tables, don't have resource policies. So a DynamoDB table cannot grant cross-account access. So in order to access a DynamoDB table, uh, cross account, you need instead to do an initial step, which is there's a role inside the same account that yeah. has access to the DynamoDB table. And then the role needs to be assumable cross account. And the role has a trust policy, which is its resource policy, that then is the thing that creates that cross account connection. Now, there's, a notable, no amount of, yep. there's no amount of role you can write in account A that gives you access to DynamoDB in account B. It has Correct. to be an assumed role in the same account. Okay. Um, and uh, the other uh, the other thing to note, and it's minor, is that, again, when we talk about inside a single account, a resource policy can unilaterally grant access, um, except for the resource policies on KMS keys and IAM roles, which are required to access them. So with an S3... S3 bucket, as I mentioned, if I just in the same account attach a policy to a role, that role can access the bucket. Right. But with an IAM role, so within account role assumption and within account access to KMS keys, the policy needs to be on both sides as well. Okay. All right. Um, now, those are the only two resources I'm aware of that work that way. Um, well, it, but it, you can it, imagine for security reasons, you want the thing to have exactly. to grant you access. Um, to 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 control that access to itself. Yeah, and and that's something. So two things. Number one, how many people do you know have that kind of stuff memorized, right? So I was watching Ben earlier, and he was type, he was using I don't I don't remember exactly what you're using, but oh, you had the AWS config syntax memorized, and I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive because I just you know I do my AWS config. Well, we'll show that. Up, but I, yeah, exactly. Uh, but the second thing is, and, and I know this is a kind of a you know broad statement, but I, I, we get a lot of questions on why is it so hard? Why do you have to do all that? Bottom line is security is hard. Security is a hard thing, and, and security done right is, it can, can be complex. And, 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 and sometimes you have to go, it is hard, but it's worth learning. And I think, Ben, that's kind of the approach you've taken. Yeah. So we'll see here. Um, uh, so what I've done is I've created two accounts. Um, there's a source account and a destination account. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this first template, uh, which is going in the destination account. And it takes as parameters an account to trust. So what other account can assume this role? And then whether for the bucket and table that I have, do I want to allow or deny access? And so you see here, um, account to trust in this policy, in this template, it's a string and it has a default that says, and the default is a value, a special value called not set. With bucket access and table access, I don't have a default, so they are required, and they're only allowed to be either allow or deny. Okay. And not, not yet up there is not a special cloud formation. That's just your special value. These these right. values. Well, they correspond yeah, no. to the IAM policy. Yeah, I just want to clarify. On line number four, you've got that default of not set. Uh, that's oh, yeah, not yeah. a cloud formation default. That's just that's Ben's own special. Correct. That he's and so using. what I'm doing so there is I'm I'm that. testing. I'm creating a condition for is account to trust set, and it. it's this is true if account to trust is not equal not set. So if you've changed it from that default, it is then gotcha. this condition is true. Um, 
And so we'll see down here. So I create a bucket. And as you should, uh, you want a public access block configuration on it. Whenever you're creating a bucket, unless it's explicitly going to be a website bucket, put this on. Or have some sort of public access on it, put this on. Now, um, isn't that by default true? No. Is it not? OK. No, because that I would be like, backwards incompatible, right? It's now available. Probably. Now, maybe Sam should make it a default. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. OK. Um, but there's no, so what this does, right? Now, S3 buckets are not, don't grant public access by default. Right, right, right. No, I get that. Yeah. But they don't have the block public access uh, configuration on that prevents public access from being set. Right. So if I didn't do this, the bucket would not be publicly accessible, but no. I would be able to change, oh, this given object is now publicly accessible. Right, right. And that's a good call out. Yep. And then I create a DynamoDB table um, with just a primary key um, following this convention uh, that Alex Debris mentioned on the AWS FM uh, session that he was on last Thursday, uh, that the, the keys are not... Are, are about your access patterns, not about the data inside. So right, there's, right. instead of making it a particular attribute of the record that you might be storing in there, it's just a generic thing that says, this is how I access that record, not the data that I'm going to read from it, which gives me flexibility in what I make those access patterns. I make my billing mode pay per request uh, because this is gonna get, you know, 100 requests at most in the next hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't wanna, I don't want to continue paying for it after that. And then I'm going to create this IAM role. So first, an IAM role needs to have an assume role policy document. So this is, again, that resource policy for a role that says, what can assume it? And so we see it's, it's just like a regular IAM policy, which means it has an effect, which is either allow or deny. It has an action. And the action for an assume role policy document has to be assume role, because that's what it's for, right? That's what you do right, to a right. role. Yeah, exactly. yep. I'm also including this set source identity permission. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is after I go through this template. And then I say what principle can take this action on this role, right? Now, if, yeah. you, if you attach a policy to a role or a user, you don't usually have principle in it. You have resource. And you don't need no. principle in it because it's attached to a principle. So the policy knows what principle it is. It doesn't know what resource it is. In this case, we're attaching it to a resource. It knows what resource it is. It doesn't know what principle is going to be using it. That makes sense. And so we're doing two things in here. We're saying, all right, it trusts this account. So we use the ARN of the root user, which is the same as the account. Um, and then we say, if that other account to trust uh, is set, we're going to trust that other account. Otherwise, we're going to use this special value, AWS no value, which just removes this whole thing from the template. Now, real quick, I want to point out for, for those who might be new to SAM or CloudFormation, on line 59 there where Ben's got that AWS account ID, he's dynamically loading that on, based on the account that this is run in. So when he deploys this, it'll grab the account ID. And these are pseudoparameters that you can, I mean, you can grab the, the, uh, the, the stack uh, name. I think, now I can't think of anything, Ben. Yes, stack yeah, name. Stack name, name is a good one. one. Yep. Region. Uh, yeah, some different, so, so really helpful things, uh, of not hard coding in here. Cause, cause you want to share your templates, right? You want to do cross accounts. So, and then the account to trust is that variable from above, uh, that he's just referencing. So he's using a substitute, uh, function to actually change that out. CloudFormation will do that before it pushes it. Yep. And if the names that you're using in your substitution are names that exist in the template, like account to trust or these pseudo parameters, yep. you only need to include the string. Now, yep. old style CloudFormation said, whatever values you had in here, you had to provide a map that defined uh, this name to the value. Mm -hmm. But more recent CloudFormation says, well, if this is just a name that already exists in the template, you don't need to use a map to do that. Now, however, on the other hand, if I was like joining together, it doesn't make sense for right. ARNs, but if I was joining together multiple things, um, I would want, a single name in here and then some sort of join or whatever it is outside 
um, uh, mapped that way. So then yeah. that's the assume role policy document on here. That's the trust policy. And then the policies that I'm actually attaching to it is this inline policy. Um, I'm actually doing it as two separate inline policies. I could also do it as a single policy with two separate statements. Um, this one, uh, we're going to call it bucket access. And we're going to use allow or deny as we put on uh, the other, as we put in that input. And that's the access to this particular bucket at you know, anything inside it for Git object. Now, and I wanna, yep. I'm going to stop you there for a minute because a lot of times folks will just stop the forward slash star is critical. Uh, and can, can you explain why? I mean, that's because a lot of times we get confused and just put, put the bucket. Yes. Well, so, so the get object action is on objects inside the bucket. Exactly. And so those arms look like this. Um, this is... Uh, uh, so then the bucket is the bucket name is here, and then the path of the object goes after that. So you right. say it's inside the bucket. Now, if I put a star here, it would be any bucket. Right. Um, but this says it has to be this bucket, but it can be any object inside it. Yep. Yep. Now note uh, that if I did not have this, this policy would not include any S3 permissions, but the bucket policy on the bucket would potentially be able to grant me access, grant this role access to itself. Then we go through the DynamoDB table and you can see, for example, that the ARN here has the region in it and the account ID where S3 does not have those. And then we're saying when we do get item where that operation is on the table, um, the item that we're getting is not part of the ARN. Uh, you can have conditions in this policy, in this statement that says your, uh, the keys that you're using have to look like a particular thing, but that's not part of the ARN. Now, on the other hand, unlike with the bucket, if we didn't have this permission granted in here, there's no other way for this role to get access to DynamoDB. Mm -hmm. So we'll deploy this in the destination account. And we're going to deploy the following template in the source account. Oh, and on this template, uh, then once we have all of that, we get the role arm, the bucket name, and the table name out. So we, we have a question here, a couple actually, sure. uh, while you're deploying. So back to the question on the bucket, uh, the tech guy says, don't you have to specify path to the bucket also? No. So the, the access to the bucket itself is not checked. So on the other hand, if I wanted uh, head bucket, um, which is the tell me about this bucket or any of the other things that you want to look on it, like the bucket Metadata policy and any of those things. Stuff, yeah. Those actions operate on the bucket resource, but I don't need permission to know anything about the bucket to get the object. I only need to know about the object itself. So that's why the get object, uh, um, the get object action only requires uh, the, um, the object, object yep. ARN. And uh, where you can see this, let me uh, find this here. Um, there's a whole service authorization reference um, that includes all of the actions and which resources uh, they need. And I've put that in the private chat for you all right. uh, if you want to link it out. It. Yep. Um, it. And so I, I linked to the S3 one, but all of the services are in there. And it tells you every action, whether it has a required resource, optional resource. Um, uh, and those optional resources are things that are checked only if certain things happen in there. Um, and then they also include all the condition keys. So the things you can do around like S3 object tagging is in there. This, um, this goes back, and, and Ben, you weren't here for, for la last week. We actually had this discussion because uh, Nick was doing a demonstration on that the large payloads. <laughs> I don't know if you heard, we tweeted about it, but he caused a sev too because he could not get access to the bucket working. So he did 
what we always do, just open it wide up. And at AWS, if you have an AWS account, that that alerts people and you get in a lot of trouble and your boss gets woken up in the middle of the night. First time I ever did that, I happened to be in Moscow and I was only two weeks new to the company and I was speaking at a conference and I had a call in the middle of the night from someone much higher than me saying, shut the bucket down. Yep. But the point, the point is... There's really never, and maybe Ben, you, you you might disagree with this, but I think this is a true statement. There's never a reason why a bucket itself should be public. You can have a private bucket with public stuff inside of it or accessible stuff. Again, it comes back down to that granular permissions and understanding how your app approaches that. Yep. I mean, there's an argument that you should always be putting like CloudFront in front of a bucket that you sure. want to be public, things like that. Um, yeah. I think there are probably cases where you want to give direct access to a bucket, um, but it's definitely a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Requester pays, edge. things like that. I don't know. Um, but in general, uh, the answer is no. Yeah. Um, so if we go then to the source account, we're going to take in as parameters this role R and bucket name and table name. And then a parameter as to whether we want to set the source identity or not. Um, and so again, here we say that can be either the string true or false. Um, and then we're going to uh, create four functions. And so we're using Sam here. We've got the transform up at the top. And so uh, for every function, we're going to set the runtime to Python 3.9. We're going to set the timeout to 30 seconds. We're going to set all of those inputs as environment variables. And then we're going to do this code URI source. So in this, uh, let me go in here and um, uh, if I look at the structure of this, now let me go, this will be easier to see from just the GitHub page. So inside here, um, I have my templates and then I have this source directory. Inside the source directory, I have multiple handler Python functions. Each one has a handler function inside of it. And then I can additionally have common code in here as well. I don't need it for this. Um, but I often, in a situation like this, when I'm creating a service that goes in a single template, I have a single source directory. At the, in the source directory, I have all of the handler functions at the top level, and then like a single common package that's usually named after the like the application name. So in this case, it might be like assume role Lambda yeah. demo. And then those can import it, right? Each handler can say import Lambda demo and use that common code. And when I'm using SAM, because they all these functions in the template all have the same code URI, it builds that exactly once, uploads it once, and then reuses that for all the deployment of the lambdas. So I'm not incurring an overhead of having separate zip files for each lambda. Now, and if the size of the zip file, like the difference in between the different lambdas is uh, all uh, roughly the same, like if I'm not adding a huge amount, one of them needs you know, a 30 megabyte you know, binary for some reason in there. Um, or some giant library, NumPy, in only one of the functions. Um, there's not much overhead in terms of cold starts or anything like that to, to having all of the code for the, for the application um, in every function, even though not all of the code is used by every function. In this particular, um, in this particular template, uh, all the functions do the same thing. They essentially have identical code because what we're talking about is different ways of writing the same thing. Um, but if I had a CRUD you know, API, I'd have the code for create, read, update, and delete in every function, even though it's the handler that's being used and pulled out of that common zip file for each one is a particular different uh, set of code. Um, I don't like common code de deployed as layers. Um, the reason for that is then my dependencies are not really visible through my code. They're only visible through my infrastructure. And I don't, I don't tend to like that. Um, 
I, I don't yeah. mind it. Ben and I have had this conversation, and, and we've debated this before. I don't mind it. Uh, I, I understand what he's saying. That, that requirement sex right next to your code. There you go. And and I do that. Now here's here's my here's my compromise, Ben. I do that for code. I think is going to change a lot. Some 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 classes, some things that I'm going to use that are shared across different ones. And I'll actually have the layer internal my SAM template, and it's updated on deploys, built, and things like that. And then I'll use. Um, a, for like a NumPy that's huge, I'll do a layer for that kind of thing that's separate. So I'll actually have yeah. usually two layers on a large application. But if I'm building some quick small stuff, I I have done this structure as well. So that's yeah, and I think and and for me, um, layers make sense when they can be updated independently of the code and the function. And yep. if they can't be, then it doesn't really make sense to deploy it as a separate resource. Right, and they um, can be just just. Just well, they can be, there. but yeah. the code that you're putting in it, right? If you're putting especially your right. own common code into a layer that often has tight coupling with the code that's deployed in the function. Okay. And therefore, oh, well, I'm updating the code in the layer. I also have to update my Lambda when yeah. I deploy this. That to me is a code smell of where that code should just be in the Lambda as a matter of course, because it doesn't have an ind independent life cycle. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, that like one... NumPy, right, is something where you might say, yeah, this is a minor version bump of NumPy. We're going to bump it in the layer. Right. And the code sh should just work. You know, obviously things can break, but nominally there is an independent life cycle between those things. Um, yeah. I do want to keep that. going. Yeah, yeah, um, no, I agree with that. And so uh, in this particular case, I'm creating a separate role. Uh, normally, I put policies directly on serverless function resources, which automatically creates a role for the function and attaches those policies to the role. However, um, because all of these functions perform exactly the same thing, they should share the same identity. So they're all going to use the same role, which is not something that I can do through SAM. And therefore, I'm creating this role independently. So this assume role policy document is going to allow assume role uh, from two things. One is the Lambda service, and the other is just within the same account. I'm going to attach the basic execution role, which gives me logs permissions that has more stars than it needs. Um, that is also the case with the managed SAM policy, so that it gives the permission to write to any log group, not just the log group that belongs to that Lambda. Um, but that is not something that has changed. Um, and then it has assume role on that role arm that we're, that we're passing in. So that role arm from this other template, from the other account, from the destination account, we now, this role has permission to assume role and set source identity on it. Okay. So, so then we have four functions. Each one is calling out a different handler within that same zip. Now, this is in this particular really case, they're all- Really good use of the global section, by the way. I'm just giving you props there. Nice yep. job. And I'm including role not in the globals because normally every function does something different and so should have a different role and different permissions. Yeah. I'm separating out these handlers here by, by file. So it's handler1.handler. But in the same way, I could have one handlers.py and different functions inside for the different handlers, depending on what you want to do. So... Then I have, uh, um, I'm going to have to skip, I think, the AWS SSO piece um, and just. Because uh, um, I keep interrupting you. Well, we only have 20 more minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I'm going to skip this. Um, I will write it by hand just because, uh, well, actually, I can just, yeah. Um, when I was testing this before. So the point here is that uh, I can have a profile in my .aws config file for my AWS SSO usage. So this defines, oh, this is the AWS SSO instance that I have. This is the account ID that I'm going into with a particular uh, role. And then this is the region that I want to use for my API calls. So this region is how should the CLI or SDK go talk to AWS SSO, like where is my SSO configuration? And this is great. I've got per, like credentials back from SSO. Where do I go use those credentials to go call S3? 
Source and target. Yep, and I've got two of these source and destination here. Um, and uh, uh, someone asked, why not Graviton? Uh, because I didn't think of it. Because uh, I Well, this was written uh, shortly before that came out. But absolutely, there's nothing I'm doing in here that wouldn't work with Graviton. Um, it's all pure Python. It's not doing anything fancy. Um, so if I added that, it should, quote unquote, just work. Um, so now in here, um, so I can show here, I've logged into AWS SSO. So, and I've got these profiles. So I can do AWS STS git caller identity, which uses credentials to tell you, um, about who's calling. What did I call it in here? Zoom roll demo. And there's actually autocomplete on the AWS CLI there. Uh, so I don't, um, so you can see there on that. And if I go in here and I say destination, it's thinking, there we go. Um, I get auto completion there and I can do this. Now, one of the things that you notice that it doesn't tell me here is uh, what the account name is. And I find that annoying. Um, and I find this R and hard to read. Um, so I've written a tool, AWS Who Am I, that allows us to do these things. Um, and we'll go check uh, your IAM account alias um, and print that out if you have access to that. So this tells me, oh, I'm in assume role demo source, and it's recognized this as an AWS SSO uh, ARN and pulled out the appropriate name inside here. So it says, oh, great, great. I'm administrator access in there. My role session name is Ben K. So now I'm going to go through and uh, deploy this. And so the deploy script in here. Um, asks for two things. Uh, you can give it two different profiles because they're going to go into different accounts. Um, and you need a, you can tell it to trust a given account, but it will pick it up from stack two if you don't provide it. Um, you can give it a stack name prefix, all these things, use source identity. So if you want to run this on your own, um, uh, someone asked, where can they find that AWS Who Am I tool? That's in the private chat, a link to that. Okay. Um, I didn't, so I'm I didn't gonna say. The... No, I'll get it. I'll get it. Go ahead. Assume role demo destination. So stack one is that uh, template one, which is the destination, and stack two profile is source. So I'm gonna run this. And this is going to use source identity. So while this is running, let's talk about source identity. Um, so when you assume a role, you have to provide a role session name. And that role session name identifies the session um, and is included in the ARN of that assumed role and shows up in CloudTrail, things like that. Now, there is a condition uh, that allows you to say, uh oh, what's going on here? Stack one, template file, file, so far as this. Let's see what happens when I call that. Oh, I must specify a region. No, I provided that in there. Um, why is Sam deploy not picking that up? No, that's not where I want to go. I'm going to go in here. Stack one profile. Parameters. All right. So I'm going to get, while he's working on that, I'm going to yeah, get a ahead. link to the, uh, I'm going to go back to, we had a couple questions here. Um, <clears throat> is, um, let me jump back here real quick. One of the things uh, they were asking when we were talking about cross account, I think someone asked, uh, is this more in lines uh, to the announcement of SQSQ triggering a cross account uh, Lambda? 
Yeah, yes and no. I mean, in, in the simple fact that it's it's allowing us to do some cross-account work, this is how you would do it when you're having the Lambda Assume role to do some things. Uh, SQS, this is a feature that we're, that's being built in uh, to, to trigger things across account, uh, and there'll be the securities wrapped in that as well. Uh, I think we had a follow-up question. Ben, just tell me when you're ready, and I'll, I'll be quiet here. But Yeah. Uh, um, uh, so chaos five four four. I think some other folks answered. Uh, irrelevant to the topic. How can I get production level experience for an SA cert owner? Zero hands on. This is how, how do I get experience with this, man? And I thought there was a, is a great uh, Zach said this. Uh, Zach, who is one of our newest, by the way, community uh, builders. So super excited about that. Uh, AWS or uh, in fact any cloud certificate with hands on gives you better learning experience. Yeah, I I, I would say do it. You literally just do it. And you say production level, but start even at not production level. Build build demos, build applications, get it out there, get a GitHub out there that shows uh, what you could do. Find out what people want to see. I mean, ben, this, ben does this all the time. In fact, I was giving him a hard time. He had asked on Twitter the other day, has anybody built whatever? And, and I responded with, you know, if anybody could do it, it's my buddy Ben, and 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 he did. You went and built it, and so just it's that really that that idea of just building it and and showing have a public repo where you can show that stuff off, blog about it, uh, and and then and then that gets you especially. And, and I'm sure this is more of a question of how do I get a job doing this? This is stuff that shows people that hey, I'm doing this. So, um. One other, while that's going, uh, so is their way, and, and we had talked about this earlier, but just to clarify, is there a way to get access to DynamoDB table across account without creating a role in that account and assuming it? No, there's not. You got to do that's, that. And that. Right, and that's exactly the thing is, yep. um, and that's true of many resources in AWS. Um, uh, and so that's why you often ru run into this assume role that's also, for example, how you might provide access to a third party uh, AWS tool, right? That analyzes your AWS account. They say, hey, we need to assume a role in your account to go do these things, right? So um, the cross account role assumption is one of the, the primary ways that you, uh, that you do this. Now, again, so going back to the source identity, right? The role session name is something that's required when you call assume role. Um, however, if that role has permissions to assume another role, then uh, there's no requirement that the role session name that was used in the first one, which you can control, is exactly the same when they assume the next thing. Source identity fixes this. So once source identity is set, it is sticky. It is not changeable. It persists through and is not changeable through every subsequent assume role. Okay. And so the it's lifetime a lifetime of practice. that invocation. Uh, for the, the lifetime of the session, yes. Okay. Um, so, because when, when you make an assume role call, it gives you back a session. And that session has a source identity associated with it if that is set. Um, so, it's a good practice to whenever you're providing an assume role permission, also provide set source identity. You want to think about whether you want to enforce conditions on it. For example, if you're using AWS SSO or IAM users, you may say that, oh, that username that's coming in through that needs to be the source identity. Now, once they've assumed that role, you know that their source identity is, uh, you know that their source identity is their username, and then that's going to follow them around through the system, and you can see in CloudTrail and know that that's a trustable value. Uh, CloudTrail, if you're not familiar with CloudTrail, CloudTrail traces API calls. It's, it's more of a management tool. Uh, super helpful for knowing. It saved my can a couple times. Uh, I used to, I did some contract work where they had deleted all their Lambda functions. Someone went in and they blamed me. And I was able to pull up CloudTrail and say, nope, I didn't do it. This person did it at this time. And here's the command, you know, here's what happened. So it's, if you're managing, if you're doing contract, contract work, things like that, it's a great great tool to help watch over things oh dear yeah yeah i think now you had added right before we came on here you had added some no, stuff I, know, I, I think that'll work yeah i wonder if that's yeah yeah that's my guess 
I can't remember if this is not supposed to be a list. It's supposed to be a dict, but I'm just uh, going to. Uh, um, so the nice thing about this deploy script is it checks if things exist and updates them. Uh, so this should go fairly quickly. Uh, ben, if you'll show me which one has the who am I in it, I, apparently I'm not sure in the links you gave me. Uh, is it the air utilities? Oh, no, it isn't in there. Okay. Yeah, if you'll post it, I'll post that I out. I thought I'd put it in there. Got it. Thank you, sir. All right, for those who were asking for it, I'm going to post that right now. The nice thing is once this is built, um, and it's building off these requirements, which is just Boto 3, um, which I don't really need um, because that is in there um, mm -hmm. in the Lambda function already, and I'm not relying on anything recent. Um, I'm using uh, a recent version of AWS Assume Role Lib and then AWS Air Utils, um, which I'll, I'll show very quickly. Okay. Um, so that should be almost done. So while that's finishing. Uh, yeah, let me just go into the function yeah. code because we don't actually need to wait. So this is uh, the most basic approach, which is just saying we're going to call assume role directly. So in here, we're going to import OS so we can get environment variables. We're going to import Boto3. We're going to import this thing called errors from AWS error utils. We're going to go and fetch all of the um, environment variables. And for use source identity, we're going to turn it into a Boolean. If it's uh, if it matches something that looks kind of true, um, and then that's it in our initialization inside our handler. Every time it's called, we're going to make an STS client just using Boto3.client, which will use the credentials that are just sitting in there in Lambda. We're going to go fetch the ARN of the Lambda's role using Git caller identity, and then we're just and that's just one of the return things that we saw. Now, if we're using source identity, we're going to call STS assume role with the role ARN that we pass in. So that's the destination role ARN. This is the source role ARN. We're going to set the role session name. That's required. And we're going to set that from the environment variable that's always there that AWS provides. It's just the function name. So when we say who's using this role, essentially, the role session name is just going to be the function name. The source identity here will set it to be the same value because they're essentially kind of the same. Uh, for uh, if we're not using source identity, then it will be just the role ARN and the role session name because again, this is required. We get the credentials from that response, um, and then we go and we create another client, STS client. But this time, we don't want it to be the default thing, which is using the credentials from the Lambda, we want to use these credentials we got back. So we have to break out this access key ID, secret access key and session token, and put it into the client to make that client use this assumed role that we have. So we get the caller identity, we put the ARN on there. Um, now we create an S3 client and a DynamoDB client on here, um, again, using those credentials. And then we go try and get the object, and we try and get the uh, uh, the item from the table. And we're using just the function, like function one is the key in both in both of those. Now, if the access is denied, normally what you have to do here is you have to catch bodocore.exceptions.client error, and then inspect inside the error. There's a error dictionary. No, there's a response field with an error, the response field is a dictionary that has an error key, and then inside that, there's code and message. Right. Um, and you got to go check that the, if the code is access denied. In this case, you can just say, accept errors.access denied, and that will catch when that Boto Core client error has the code access denied. So AWS Error Utils makes that code a lot cleaner. I just posted that link, by the way, if you're looking for yep. it. And you can uh, you can view the details on on the GitHub 
uh, for that. And then just returns what's the source role R and what's the destination role R and is it using source identity and did it get back the value um, or was the access denied? So then we move on, we're gonna make this better. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna switch to sessions. So in particular, a session packages up credentials and configuration into an object that you can reuse. So what I'm gonna do here, the initialization is exactly the same, but I'm gonna start by just creating a Boto3 session. And what that does is it's going to, when you don't provide any inputs there, it's just gonna say, I can go look for credentials. And it knows to look in the environment, which is where Lambda's credentials are. And in fact, when you say Boto3.client, Boto3 has a default session that gets created exactly like this that gets used to create the client. Because now you say session.client, and when you say Boto3.client, it says, internally inside that function, it says get default client dot client. Um, so here we're going to create that session explicitly. We'll get STS from it and we'll say, great, we can get the caller identity just like we did. This all looks the same. We're operating on that STS uh, client. Um, but then instead of creating another client directly, we're going to create a new assumed role session. So we pass in those credentials into the session, and then the session can be used to create the clients. So instead of copying those credentials into a bunch of different places, we only need to use it once. So we say, great, assume role session.client STS, get caller identity, assume role session.client S3. The rest of it is all the same. When we go into the third one, we're now going to say, well, we're calling assume role in handler two, we're calling assume role in every invocation but the credentials last for a while. The default session duration is an hour. You can set it to longer than that. Um, you can set it to shorter than that, down to 15 minutes. Um, but if you're calling this a lot, right? If you're calling something that does the assume role a lot, uh, you don't need to call in every invocation. That's just adding latency when you don't need it. Yeah. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're going to move that into the initialization. So we do the same thing as before. But now we're just going to create that default session um, as a global in, in here. And that's going to work because the Lambda's credentials last for the duration of the function instance. Then we're going to use it to create an STS session. And we'll get the Lambda role R, and that doesn't change. Then use source identity. Now we'll call the STS assume role. We'll get the credentials, and we'll create this assumed role session in the initialization. Now the problem here, and so we did all of this stuff that we had inside our handler. Now we can do that once and use it multiple times. So then this gets a lot simpler. You're just doing the get object and get item when it gets called. This goes back to my question earlier. Does it last? How long does it last? And that's why you were very specific. The yes. Session. Got it. So now, the we have one yeah. question that I think I'd like you to answer real quick is does is this a just a Bodo thing or is this across the other SDKs like Node? Let me get to that at the end. You got it. Um, okay. So the so this assumed role session is going to last for an hour by default. Now you but Lambda function instances if they're if they're warm if they're getting used last for longer than that. You know. Uh, Normally it's somewhere around four hours, but there's no guarantees. There's no documentation of that. That's not something that AWS customers can rely on. And so it's not a good idea to, um, uh, to um, try and make this session last for the duration of the function instance, because you don't know how that's going to be. Instead, you want to refresh it. So you could go through a whole thing because assume role returns you the expiration and you could uh, um, try to do a thing where uh, you're checking if that expiration is done, calling it again. But what AWS assume role lib does is wrap that all up for you and actually make it part of the session itself. So then if we go down to handler four, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, great, all this is the same. But now when we do this, we're going to say AWS assume role lib assume role. We're going to give it the session and the role arn. Nice. And this returns a session that knows how to refresh those credentials. So if you use the session 
and it's the credentials that it has for that assumed role session are expired, it will just go call assume role again, but it won't if the credentials are still valid. What you notice here now, I'm not setting ses role session name in here because with assume role, if you're setting source identity, it just also sets uh, role session name to be the same thing. It provides a thing that will create a Lambda session name that not only includes the function name, but also the function identifier that you can find on the CloudWatch logs so that you can see in CloudTrail, oh, this call was made by this particular instance of a function and help correlate that back to your CloudWatch logs. Now, if you're not using source identity, you don't actually even need to provide an identity at all. You can if you want to, but if you don't provide role session name, it automatically generates one for you. So you just need to provide role ARN. And then everything else is the same, but this will then work transparently. You don't have to do anything to make sure that this will work for the lifetime of the instance. Now- Dude, That is super slick. Yes, and there's one last thing that I'd like to show here. Okay. What failed in here? Um, let me just go check uh, the, oh, this is harder to view when I'm, in a different browser. Um, I don't think this created. Um, so the nice thing is that you can actually do this as part of the AWS configuration itself. Okay, this, is, this exists. Um, so let me open this up and I'm gonna go to outputs and I'm going to copy this role ARN. And I'm gonna go back to my config and I'm gonna make a profile called my assume role. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say role ARN equals this. And then I say source profile equals this whole thing. And so what this says is this configuration is assuming this role based on these credentials. So if I go back into here and I say AWS STS get caller identity uh, profile my assumed role. Did I not say this? That would help. Uh, all right. And after this, we've got a hard stop that we need yes. to shut it down. But, I agree. Uh, yeah, I do want to see this. I'll tell you what so I did nice, do. Is like, yep. go, no, you the, go, Ben. Oh, yeah. So the nice thing is you can do that in config, but you can't do it programmatically for Python. Now, you can see here that now I'm that role, and I've got this generated session name, which is actually what assume role lib uses. In other SDKs, there is programmatic role assumption built into them. In JavaScript in particular, if you look at the chained temporary credentials config object, um, that's the way that you can tell the JavaScript SDK that you want to assume a role. You don't need a third party piece to do this. That also will do the refreshing and all of those kind of things. I just posted that in, into there. All right, Ben, I hate to do it. I, we, we got no, a lot of it. questions. What I did is I did post our Twitter handles. Uh, yes, man, please, reach please out to us. up there. Yeah, reach out to us. Uh, we'll continue the conversation. Th this was phenomenal. We're going to have to do this again, obviously. There's a lot of good questions about this. Uh, and, and Ben, I, again, I really appreciate your time. With that, we're going to shut it down. We're back next week. Next week, uh, we will be uh, talk talking about, hang on just a moment here. Uh, we, I had a slide, but I'm just going to pop it up here. Next week, we're going to be talking about ARM support. If you've been watching new architecture, we're going to talk about how Sam supports that, CDK supports that. Julian Wood's going to be joining us. Uh, so with that, I'm going to shut us down. Thanks for watching. Ben, once again, thanks for coming. Always awesome to have you on. Great. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. We'll see you all later. Have a great week. And we're going out.